you guys, and welcome to the Moms and Mysteries podcast, a true crime podcast featuring myself, Mandy, and my dear friend, Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Mandy. How are you? I am doing well. Very tired. It's been a whole week. It has been a whole week since we've done this. It's been a whole busy week uh, when we had our little live moment that we don't have to talk about anymore, but it was great. We did it. It actually turned out great. We did do it. Yeah, so we had Valentine's Day, which... It's not like that big of a thing in my house. Um, I think I've mentioned before that my husband and I's wedding anniversary is on February 20th. Um, It's actually tomorrow. So we don't really celebrate Valentine's Day like necessarily like over the top, but I still do something for the kids and it still is like a lot of like just things going on, you know, during the week, just having to get things set up for like the kids and everything. So it was just a busy week. And then as you said, we had our moment, which went really well. I was so impressed with us, Melissa. I thought we did a great job. Honestly, I'm not one for compliments, but I would pat us both on the back. I would definitely pat you on the back and then would eventually pat myself on the back because I think it actually turned out well. I was really impressed. Like, I couldn't believe we pulled it off. And like the time, we got it perfect. That's due in part to Haley, of course, because she helped us research that or she researched that really. But like, it was perfect timing. It, it was. all worked out really well. It Nothing did. Really yeah. went wrong. No, I feel like all those fears that we had going into it, wondering if we were going to be able to do it or if it was going to be any good, uh, I think those were all unfounded fears, I'm happy to say. So yeah, very they happy were. that we did that. And yeah, hopefully you got to see that. If not, I don't, I don't know if you can see it now. By the time this episode comes out, it might be... You can um, see it for one more day. If, you, if you're watching this on February 21st, you have until February 22nd to watch the replay. And um, it's still available on moment.co slash moms and mysteries. There you go. Yeah. And so we also um, announced or rather showed some new merch designs that oh, yeah. I think are we're going to be live putting... now. Oh, good. Yeah. So they're live. So if you um, want to just check out the new merch and see what that looks like, you can find that on our website, momsandmysteries.com in the little merch section. Absolutely. All right. So we have a really big story to get into this week. So we're going to get straight into it. Uh, It's really hard to find statistics on exactly how often the police receive confessions to murders that were committed years or even decades earlier. But today's story is one example of that exact scenario happening. The few times that we do hear about these delayed confessions usually involve the person being on their deathbed and wanting to confess all their sins before they die, or in some cases, like in today's story, the perpetrator has experienced some type of religious awakening that's led them to feel compelled to confess to their crimes. Most of the time, the murders committed by these killers have gone unsolved for all those years until finally there's this unexpected confession. But in worst case scenarios, authorities have charged the wrong person and there's an innocent man or woman behind bars serving time for a murder they had nothing to do with. Exoneration stories make us feel good, but there's still that lingering sadness that a human being can have their life ruined or at the very least lose years off of it by sitting in prison for a wrongful conviction. Melissa, this is something that you... I know, like really care about is like yeah. the wrongfully convicted and like getting these exonerations because yeah, it's just absolutely horrifying to Everyone think loses. about. Yes. It's just so scary to even think about being in that situation and being behind bars, not having anything that you can do about it unless mm-hmm. there is something that comes out that proves that you didn't have anything to do with the crime. So today we're going to be talking about a very upsetting story where multiple lives were destroyed due to some of the most frustrating and really nightmarish circumstances imaginable. In February of 1998, the office of then Texas Governor George W. Bush received a four-page letter from a man who was already incarcerated and serving three life sentences for aggravated robbery and sexual assault. This man, Akeem Marino, had experienced a religious conversion since being in prison, one that required him to confess all of his crimes, even though he was already going to spend the rest of his life behind bars. Akeem had been attempting to confess through written letters that he sent to police and the DA's office since 1996, so for two years he was trying to confess. But after these letters were ignored, he decided to write a letter directly to the governor. Akeem confessed to the horrific murder of a woman named Nancy DePriest in 1988, 10 years earlier. In this letter, he implored authorities to take him seriously. And not just because his new religion required him to confess, but because there were two innocent young men who had already been convicted of the murder. Akeem named the men who had been falsely accused and stated that the governor's office was, quote, legally and morally obligated to contact the attorneys of Richard Danziger and Chris Ochoa 
these two men who took the fall for Nancy's murder. Akeem, though, received no response, so he continued writing to the police. Later, in 1998, Akeem sent another letter to authorities in which he provided specific information about the murder he committed, including where several pieces of evidence could be found to corroborate his confession. Police were able to track down all the items Akeem mentioned in his letter and confirm that they were, in fact, pieces of evidence from the murder of Nancy DePriest. And from there, several shocking and truly heartbreaking realities started to come to light. It was around 9.30 a.m. on October 24th, 1988, when the manager of the Rienli Street Pizza Hut arrived to open the restaurant for the day. He'd been trying to get in touch with the employee that came in first that morning, the person that comes in early to make the dough and complete the other opening duties, but he hadn't gotten an answer. Nancy DePriest had been dropped off by her husband at 7.40 that morning. Safety protocol for the restaurant was that the doors were to remain locked until the manager opened the restaurant, but when the manager arrived that morning, he found that the side door was actually unlocked. Inside, he saw that the floor was flooded and the dough machine was still running. As he walked towards the counter, he saw that 20-year-old Nancy was lying on the floor in a hallway, barely clinging to life. Nancy was nude and had been tied up with her bra. She was bleeding from the head and she had her eyes open but glazed over. The manager dialed 911 and Nancy was transported to the hospital where she tragically passed away later that day. Nancy's family made the selfless decision to donate her organs, which later helped multiple people in need. Her heart, both kidneys, liver, bone marrow, and cornea were all successfully transplanted, which I think is really amazing. I don't know. I feel like sometimes you hear about organ donors and they aren't able to use that many of their organs. So I think it was really, truly amazing that they were able to get yeah. um, that many um, successful transplants. So an autopsy later determined that Nancy had been raped and shot once in the back of the head. A rape kit was conducted and a semen sample was collected and sent to the lab. Back at the scene, investigators worked to piece together the evidence and find out what happened to Nancy. The motive appeared to be a robbery. There was an undisclosed amount of money that was taken from the restaurant. And in the previous year leading up to the murder, different pizza huts around Austin had actually been robbed four different times, but they were always late in the afternoon or at night and nobody had ever actually been hurt. So this was definitely different than the typical type of robbery they had seen. Multiple hairs were collected from different areas of the crime scene. All of Nancy's clothes were found in a sink in the women's restroom, and the sink was turned on, and the clothes that were inside of it were clogging the drain, so the water was overflowing onto the floor, and that's what was causing the flooding. There were no signs of a break-in, which led officers to believe that Nancy's attacker either had a key to the building or that she knew who the person was and had let them inside unsuspectingly. Word of Nancy's murder quickly spread throughout the company. Although there were several Pizza Hut locations in Austin, you kind of get the impression that working for the company was sort of like this big family. Everyone really knows everyone, and word gets around regardless of which location you work at. Especially, though, if you worked at somewhere and somebody had been murdered in the same, like, business, I can see how that's going to be a huge talk between various sure, yeah. Pizza Huts, right? So the murder of a 20-year-old woman at her job on a Monday morning is definitely enough to shock a community, but Nancy seems like an unlikely target for murder. Nancy was born in Fort Worth and was a Texas native. She was newly married to Todd DePriest, who was an aircraft maintenance specialist for the Air Force, and the couple had just started a family 15 months before Nancy was killed. Todd and Nancy had welcomed their baby girl around July of 1987, and her daughter and husband were really all that Nancy loved to talk about. A co-worker at Pizza Hut said that Nancy was young, she was in love, and she was happy. She loved her life, and she was a very caring and giving person. Although Nancy was a supervisor at a restaurant, those who worked with her said it wasn't like you were actually working for her. It was like you were working with her and that she was just a very nice person to be around. Nancy's murder was widely talked about in the local media and became a very high-profile case. Her family, as well as the public, were really desperate for answers. Investigators got right to work and made it their top priority to find a suspect. Pizza Hut managers and shift leaders and those who had formerly held these positions at the Rianley Street Pizza Hut were looked into. These employees all would have a master key that opened all local Pizza Hut restaurants, but after looking through this, they didn't find any suspects there. For days, investigators interviewed people but never announced any suspects, and the pressure from the public to produce results continued to grow. 
Meanwhile, those who knew Nancy, as well as fellow Pizza Hut employees from all locations, mourned her death. People were really on edge, especially when the Reinley Street Pizza Hut finally reopened for business a short time later. On November 9th, police got a call from two employees working at the restaurant who stated that there were two men who seemed suspicious and they had come into the Pizza Hut and appeared to be toasting a beer to Nancy. As it would turn out, these two men were also Pizza Hut employees, but each of them worked at different locations. Their names were Christopher Ochoa, who was 22, and Richard Danziger, who was 18. According to a security guard named Lorenzo, Chris and Richard pulled into the parking lot, sat in their car for about five minutes, and then they went inside and ordered a couple of beers. Lorenzo alleged that they barely spoke to each other, and they were scanning the restaurant suspiciously. He also said that he spoke with the two men in the parking lot, and he didn't like the questions and comments that Chris and Richard made about Nancy's murder. He said that Richard asked him when the restaurant started having security and asked him whether or not there were any suspects in the murder. So he, Lorenzo thought just asking these questions was suspicious. Personally, me, especially at 18, 20 years old, I would just be like totally naive to the fact that it would be suspicious. And I would just be like nosy asking questions, you know, trying to find out information. But especially because they worked at a Pizza Hut. So you'd want right. to know like kind of everything. And especially if they're talking about there's been other robberies and stuff. You've got to be curious what's going on. Right. Exactly. You know, everybody wants to have answers. Right. So Lorenzo said that Richard mentioned that he heard through the grapevine that Nancy's body was found by the register. He felt uncomfortable, as we said, with these questions. So he asked Richard where he was at the time of the murder. And Richard said that he was working at the North Lamar Pizza Hut that morning. Richard allegedly made a comment to the effect that he believed two people had to have been involved in Nancy's murder, not just one. So just a note here, we don't actually know how much of this is true or how much of it was embellished. And that will actually make more sense as we continue on with the story. But whether it was true or false, the employees did notify the police about Chris and Richard being there that night. Now, up until this point, Chris and Richard seemed like they were pretty normal young men. Richard had two jobs. He worked at Pizza Hut and he had another job at a Red Lobster. And Chris worked at another Pizza Hut. The two men were roommates who shared an apartment with a man named Roger. Chris was actually dating his Pizza Hut manager named Donna, whose house the two men were at the night before Nancy was killed. That night, they drank beer and talked while Donna ironed her clothes in the kitchen. At about 11 p.m., a friend of Donna's came over and the four of them started playing a drinking game. At some point during that night, or what would have really been the very early hours of October 24th, Richard left Donna's house to drive Chris home, but they both came back saying that they had broken Chris's car key. So they called their other roommate, Roger, who then came over to Donna's and picked Chris up. They left around 2 a.m. and went back to their apartment. Richard, though, stayed at Donna's house that night. Richard was supposed to be at work at Pizza Hut, not that one that Nancy was killed at, but the one he worked at at 8 a.m. on October 24th. But... He overslept after the long night of drinking and didn't wake up until his supervisor called Donna's place looking for him. So Donna answered the phone, realized what time it was, and she and Richard got ready and went into their pizza hut. They arrived around 10 a.m. But despite having these alibis, investigators felt like Richard and Chris could be responsible for the murder once they heard about their trip to Pizza Hut, where they drank these beers and toasted to Nancy's memory. Officers theorized that Richard and Chris could have access to a master key, and it was also possible that Nancy knew them since they all worked for the same company, which <laughs> Pizza Hut is quite large. It's kind of weird to be like, wow, you work at Pizza. It's like saying every podcast person that has a podcast knows each other. No, you yeah. don't. It's, well, one of, it's the most whole... yeah, one of the most surprising things in this story was finding out how many Pizza Huts there are in Austin, Texas. I was definitely <laughs> surprised to find out that there was more than just one or two for sure. Yeah. So for these reasons, and truly those were the only reasons, the police honed in on these young men as their main suspects. And there is still so much more to get into this story after we take a quick break to hear a word from this week's sponsors. So before the break, we talked about the horrific murder of Nancy DePriest while she was at her job at Pizza Hut uh, opening the store that morning. And these two men who worked at other Pizza Hut locations, Chris Ochoa and Richard Danziger, were seen a couple of weeks later at that Pizza Hut where Nancy was murdered, drinking beers and appeared to be toasting to her memory. There was a security guard there that thought that it was suspicious that these two men were there and they contacted the police to let them know. 
So two days after this suspicious Pizza Hut visit, Sergeant Boardman showed up at Donna's house, who, as we said, was Richard's girlfriend, and he was looking for Richard. And this is the point in the story that really just becomes so frustrating because we don't know Richard's side about what actually happened next. All we have to go on is what the detectives say happened. And we now know that the detectives involved in this investigation were totally corrupt. So their version of the story is likely full of lies and twisted details. Sergeant Boardman said that Richard was sitting on the couch at Donna's house when he arrived, and he agreed to step outside to speak with the investigator. Boardman told him how they'd been investigating Nancy's murder and that they needed Richard to come to the police station and answer some questions. Richard allegedly commented that he'd been waiting for investigators to come see him and wondered why it had taken them so long. And he then pointed at Donna and said, that's my alibi. Once Richard was at the police station, Sergeant Boardman and Sergeant Polanco began conducting an interview. It's important to note that Sergeant Polanco had a reputation for always closing his cases. He used some pretty hardball techniques to really overwhelm and scare the people that he was interviewing and interrogating. And it was later uncovered that he was also suspected of physically beating suspects, coercing confessions, and lying in court. So in other words, he just was not a very good officer. Sergeant Boardman asked Richard to tell them what he knew about the murder. So keep in mind, as we said before, there's going to be some gossip and chatter when something like this happens in your company or in your friend group or anything. So it's not unusual that somebody who had nothing to do with the murder would know at least a few details right. just from rumors that have gone around. So Richard told them that he knew Nancy had been shot in the back of the head with a 22 caliber weapon. He also mentioned that he heard there was a blue apron in the sink, which caused the water to overflow. So Boardman immediately began making a really big deal out of this information, and he was asking Richard how he would know that, because those were details that nobody would have known, specifically the blue apron being in the sink. They wouldn't, nobody would know that unless they were there. So Boardman then left the room to call his supervisor in. So I was thinking, like, these, these people all work at Pizza Hut. I'm sure they all have the same uniform. So is right. it really that weird that he would specifically say blue apron? If that's what they wore at Pizza Hut, then of course that's what he would say. Um, no. So, you know, I don't think that's such a shocking detail that he would know that. He also works at Pizza Hut. Right. Yeah, That that's where I could see more if it was from an quote unquote outsider. But somebody that works there, like that's part of their uniform. So there is another officer, Sergeant Bellagia, that comes in to interview Richard. Richard explains to this officer that he has an alibi and that he was at his girlfriend Donna's house all night and morning. He said he overslept and he didn't wake up until his supervisor called looking for them and then they went to work. So Richard then told the detective that they didn't have any evidence that would link him to the crime, but Bellagia immediately flipped the script and gaslit Richard, telling Richard that his reaction was unusual for someone accused of capital murder. Richard said, quote, you're not going to pin a capital murder on me, end quote. Richard was then asked specifically what he knew about the crime scene. So Richard said he knew the victim was shot in the back of the head with a 22 caliber handgun and that the floor was flooded because of a blue apron in the sink. He was totally confident that the police could not make a case against him. Again, all of this is according to what the detective said. This interrogation was not recorded and the investigators never even wrote a statement about the conversation. All we know is that they did let Richard go afterwards. But Chris was not so lucky. Later on that same day, Sergeant Boardman and another detective went to the Pizza Hut that Chris worked at and told him that they were there to question him about a rape, murder, and robbery that had occurred at a different Pizza Hut three weeks earlier. So Chris agrees to go with the officers back to the station, and he even rode in the police car to get there. Chris has no idea at this point that the police have already deemed him a suspect, and when he was asked what he knew about the robbery, he told him he didn't know anything about it. That's when Sergeant Polanco pounded his fist on the table and yelled at Chris, telling him that if he didn't come clean with the truth, he was going to get the death penalty. At this point, Chris is terrified, but he repeated again he didn't know anything, nor did he know who did it. So for the next several hours, Chris was interrogated with unethical and almost inhumane techniques being used to manipulate him. Sergeant Polanco would leave the room and then Sergeant Bellagio would come back in, each with this different tactic aimed at getting Chris to confess to a murder that he did not commit and that these officers have absolutely no proof that he committed. It was a classic good cop, bad cop scene unfolding in the interrogation room. Polanco would come in hot and ready to throw the book at him, literally threatening him with death. And then Bellagio would come in and apologize for his hot-headed partner and try to comfort and reason with Chris. The back and forth went on for quite some time. And eventually, the other officer who brought Chris into the station came into the room. 
Chris thought this officer, who was a female, might have a little more compassion for him. So he asked her if he could have an attorney. And she angrily and incorrectly responded that Chris could not have an attorney until he was officially charged with a crime. Chris, who, as we said, was just 22 years old, didn't know any better. So he believed her. He'd never even been in trouble with the law or so much as gotten detention in school. And he was raised to believe that when the police tell you to do something, you do it. So he was wanting to be totally cooperative, even though he was absolutely terrified. Shortly after this interaction with the female officer, Sergeant Polanco came back in and got right into Chris's face again, talking about the death penalty. He actually grabbed Chris's arm and tapped him on the veins and told him that's where the needle will go when they execute him. Chris later wrote about this experience, and he said that at this point, it it was almost like he was begging Polanco to believe him, and he was fighting back genuine tears of fear, just not knowing where this was going to end up. Right, man. The detective showed Chris graphic photos of Nancy's injuries and urged him to do the right thing and admit that he shot her, which again, seeing images like that, especially as someone who truly did not have anything to do with it, it's just... Oh my gosh, what that has to do to somebody. It's just so heartbreaking. So as the hours ticked by, Chris grew more and more exhausted and scared. He said there were no clocks on the walls and he felt like he was trapped in a room he couldn't get out of. He still felt that the police did have his best interests at heart and refused the whole thought that they would actually hurt him for something he didn't do. Polanco would say things to confuse Chris, such as that maybe he blocked out the crime because it was so bad and he would just feel better if he admitted that he did it, but he didn't do it. So eventually, Sergeant Polanco went back into the room and told Chris that he knew he and his roommate Richard went to the pizza hut where the murder happened and that they had asked a lot of questions while they were there. He then asked Chris if his roommate committed the crime. Chris said he had no idea. And that's when Polanco stormed out of the room and slammed the door behind him. When he came back, he told Chris that he must have been the lookout person waiting for Richard in the getaway car. Chris again denied everything and stated he was innocent. Polanco eventually told Chris that he was going to be thrown in jail where he'd be, quote unquote, fresh meat to the other inmates, which Chris took to mean that he would be raped. And that's when Chris said he'd had enough. He had really reached his breaking point. Chris asked Polanco what he'd have to do or say to get to go home. And Polanco said they would need a statement. Chris was made to initial and sign a card. And then Polanco brought in a typewriter. Polanco asked Chris questions as he typed. Polanco asked whether Richard committed the murder and told Chris about it later, and he said yes, implicating poor Richard in the murder once more. Polanco continued to ask a line of leading questions about Richard's involvement, and Chris just started agreeing with everything the detective said. Once Polanco finished typing up the statement, Chris signed it and then asked if he could leave. Chris was then told that they needed to take samples from him. They needed his blood, hair, and semen to make sure he wasn't at the scene. Chris agreed, and Bellagia said they would take him to a hospital to get these samples taken. So once that was done, Chris again asked if he could go home. But that's when the detectives told him they feared for his safety, considering the fact he had just signed a statement against Richard, and they were worried that Richard might come after him because of it. So instead of going home, they take Chris to a hotel for the weekend and told him he could order room service, but he wasn't allowed to leave the room or to call anyone. Chris followed these instructions for the most part, except he did call his other roommate, Roger, and told him what was going on and said that he was going to need a lawyer. When the investigators came back to the hotel on Monday morning to take Chris back to the police station, they said to him, now we know you had something to do with the crime because you called your roommate and asked for an attorney. Only guilty people ask for attorneys. So Chris was then taken straight to another interrogation room where the questioning began all over again. They said he needed to make another statement, this time on tape recording. Chris said the same story he told on Friday, but this time the detectives told him to say that he was outside of the Pizza Hut waiting in the getaway car as Richard committed the crime. Next, they gave him a polygraph test where he answered yes or no questions about the crime. After this test was over, Chris was left alone in the room for a very long period of time. And when Sergeant Polanco and Sergeant Bellagia finally came back, they told Chris that he actually failed this polygraph and that not only did he fail it, but they now believed that Chris was actually inside the Pizza Hut with Richard during the murder. 
They insinuated that Richard was the mastermind and Chris had just gone along with it because he was scared of Richard. And they said if Chris told them what really happened, they would talk to the DA and get him a deal, probably 60 years in prison, but with time and good behavior, he would walk out of prison a healthy young man and go on with his life. But if he didn't cooperate with them, then he would get the death penalty. Chris just wanted the questioning to stop and he was mentally worn down by this point. He asked them what they wanted him to say. Polanco then got out a tape recorder and started asking questions. So while he was answering these questions, he really was just guessing at all of the answers. And when he would get one wrong, or rather not what Polanco wanted to hear, he would stop the tape and he would make these verbal threats at Chris. And then he would start rolling the tape again and have him answer it again. This process went on forever. And Polanco lost his cool and threw his chair across the room at one point and then said he was just going to do this the easy way. He pulled out the typewriter and decided he was just going to type up the statement. So witnesses were then brought into the room to watch Chris sign the statement. And a couple of hours later, he was booked into the county jail after being interrogated for over 20 total hours and, of course, being isolated and held hostage pretty much in a hotel room for two days. I love that they were like, oh, we need witnesses for his signature, but nothing about what was written. Like, you guys don't need to worry that he never said these things, but you do need to make sure that he signed it. Right. So in the end, the official story a.k.a. the false confession that was signed by Chris, stated that he and Richard planned the murder together the day before they did it. They got to the Pizza Hut at 7 a.m., and Richard was armed with a gun. Chris said they used a key to get in the side door, and once they were inside, they forced Nancy to open the safe. Next, he said they tied Nancy up, and both of the men sexually assaulted her. Richard then shot Nancy in the back of the head, and the men used water from the women's bathroom to wash her body of evidence. They put her clothes in the sink and turned on the water which he said they all did all of these things also to get rid of evidence. The very next day, November 15th, Richard, who was actually visiting one of his relatives' homes, was arrested and he was charged with capital murder along with Chris, a charge that could carry the death penalty. DNA samples were collected from Richard upon his arrest. The media was immediately notified that the two men had been arrested and stories that they had been in trouble before and had been investigated for two other Pizza Hut related robberies the same year. We're 99% sure that's a lie that they made up to bolster their credibility, which they desperately needed to keep intact because they had very little to justify these charges. All they really had was Chris's confession, which had been coerced through intimidation. But in the state of Texas, a co-defendant's confession is not enough evidence to secure a conviction. Other evidence has to corroborate that confession. In this case, they didn't have anything of the sort. The case against Richard and Chris was incredibly weak. The Austin American Statesman reported that at Richard and Chris's bond hearings on November 21st, the defense argued that the men could only be held without bond if prosecutors showed there is ample evidence that a jury would convict them of their charges. The prosecution declined to present such evidence and recommended that their bond be set at $100,000 each. How do you get to decline? Yeah, well, they're basically saying we don't have any evidence, which is just like the craziest thing. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So the DNA samples from both men were sent off for testing, and the person who ran the test reported that Richard and Nancy's husband were eliminated as suspects, but Chris could not be eliminated as the source of the semen. Keep in mind, this is 1988. This type of testing is not what it is today, and it really wasn't very accurate. It's not like it said... It was Chris. It said he can't be eliminated. The test failed to reveal a blood type dissimilar to Nancy, so no potential source of the semen could be excluded because Nancy's blood group markers could have, quote unquote, masked the perpetrator. A different pathologist tested the hair samples and compared them to hairs found at the crime scene. In addition to comparing hairs from the scene to Richard and Chris, they also compared the hairs to Nancy and her husband to rule them out. One of the hairs found in the arcade area of the Pizza Hut was found to be consistent with Richard's pubic hair. However, the hair found in the arcade was missing its root, which made the comparison very weak. So to summarize, the results of the DNA forensic testing showed that Chris could not be excluded from the semen found, and Richard could not be excluded from the hair. Even though we've just explained how these are not accurate or definitive results whatsoever, it only made the prosecution's case stronger. 
Chris was given a court-appointed attorney, which turned out to just be another nightmare of a situation for him. Chris thought that this attorney was, of course, a safe person for him to talk to because it's his lawyer, and he told them that he had given a false confession, and it was because he was coerced through these intense intimidation tactics, but his attorney didn't believe him. They refused to investigate Chris's claims and told him his only choice to avoid the death penalty was to plead guilty and to testify against Richard. So a little side note here, Chris's attorney was actually so convinced of his guilt that when Chris's post-conviction counsel reached out to ask about DNA testing, his attorney actually said not to waste their time because there was, quote, not a chance that Chris was innocent, end quote. And the attorney then went even further and either made up or misremembered facts that supported Chris's guilt. Like, for example, the attorney said that there was an eyewitness who saw Chris at the scene and that Chris's fingerprints had been found on the murder weapon. Both of these statements were, of course, completely false. Wow. Yeah. So by April of 1989, neither of the men had been indicted. But on April 26th, a grand jury indicted Richard on just one charge of aggravated sexual assault. If convicted, this would carry a sentence of five to 99 years in prison. Richard was not indicted for murder because at this point, the investigators had now changed their minds again, and it was believed that Chris was the person who shot Nancy, not Richard. They thought that Richard had only sexually assaulted her, but did not kill her. So it's really unclear to us how or why the story changed. Um, When asked why the charges for Richard had changed, the authorities told the media, quote, we do not expect to prove that Richard was the trigger man, end quote. They really just expected to prove that he was an accomplice. So Haley wrote some of her thoughts to us and said that she thinks it's possible that Chris may have really just started feeling guilty and really bad for implicating Richard in a murder that neither one of them had anything to do with. And it's possible that he could have just like decided to change the story to make himself the killer in hopes of getting Richard, you know, a lighter sentence or getting him off for this. But we don't know if that's really true, but I can see how that would happen. Like once you're into this situation so deep and you're like, oh my gosh, now it's not just me, but it's this other person and they want me to testify against him. And you know, like this is also another innocent person. So I would be the same way. I would be like, I'm just going to say I did it. So I don't have to like have it on me that somebody else is taking the fall for this as well. Oh my gosh. Yeah. On May 5th, Chris took the advice of his attorney and ended up pleading guilty to first degree felony murder. He would receive a life sentence instead of the death penalty. And he would also testify against Richard. Richard's trial for the sexual assault of Nancy began on January 22nd, 1990. It was a very high-profile case, and the courtroom was packed with only standing room left. There was also a high-security presence. Prosecutors put Chris on the stand to testify about what supposedly happened on October 24, 1988. He said that that night, he and Richard bought beer and went over to Donna's at about 10 p.m. She was ironing in the kitchen while Chris and Richard played cards in the other room. Chris said that Richard told him he needed some money and was thinking about robbing the Rianley Street Pizza Hut, the one that Nancy worked at. At first, Chris wanted nothing to do with it, but said he eventually gave in. They decided to arrange an alibi by asking their other roommate, Roger, to come pick up Chris while Richard stayed at Donna's. Chris said that he went home and slept for about an hour and then woke up and drove to a McDonald's to meet Richard and finalize the plans for the robbery. He said Richard was driving Donna's car. He also said that Richard told him to be on the lookout and showed him a gun he had in his pants. Chris said the two men drove to an apartment complex across the street from the Pizza Hut and they waited. They watched as Nancy arrived at around 7.30 and went inside. Then the men walked across the street and Richard used a key he had to open the door and get inside. Chris said Nancy recognized him and said, What's up, Chris? At that point, Chris said that Richard told Nancy to shut up and give him all the money, all while threatening her with the gun he had. Chris said that after Nancy opened the safe for them, the men decided to rape her. Chris said that when he and Richard were done, they decided they had to kill Nancy because she knew who they were. So they took her to the hallway where the bathrooms were and made her kneel on the ground. Richard handed Chris the gun and told him to kill Nancy, and Chris said he pulled the trigger. According to his testimony, Chris and Richard then dragged Nancy to the restroom to wash her body of evidence. Chris said that they wiped surfaces in the restaurant that they had touched as well. They wiped the restroom down and stuffed aprons in the sink around the stopper and then left the water running. He said they dragged Nancy out of the bathroom and into the hallway and left her there. Chris grabbed the bag of money and handed it to Richard, and they left the scene in two separate vehicles. 
Chris then said that about three weeks later, on the night of November 9th, he and Richard were drinking at Donna's house when Richard mentioned that he took some checks to the Rian Lee Street Pizza Hut earlier that day, and he asked if Chris wanted to go there. Chris said no and told Richard to take him home, but then once they were in the car, Richard drove to the Pizza Hut anyway. He says they went inside and ordered a beer, but Chris didn't feel like drinking it, and they talked a little bit, but then they ended up leaving. In the parking lot, they talked to the security guard, Lorenzo, and Richard asked him whether or not they had any leads in the murder. Richard then took Chris home. So that's the story Chris told on the stand in Richard's trial, keeping in mind that not a lick of it is true because, as we have been saying, neither one of these men actually had anything to do with Nancy's murder. The three corrupt detectives that interrogated these two men also testified for the state. Polanco said that Chris was, quote, visibly shaken during his confession and that Richard was cool, calm, and collected. And Bellagia said further, I don't believe Richard can be intimidated. Donna took the stand for the state as well. She testified that on the evening before the murder, Rich and Chris were at her place drinking beer while she was ironing in the kitchen. She said while she was ironing for 15 to 20 minutes, she didn't know what the men talked about or what they did. At 11 p.m., Donna's friend came over and the four of them began playing a drinking game. At some point, Richard left to bring Chris home, but they came back saying that they broke Chris's car key, so they called their roommate Roger at around 2 a.m. Donna said that she was pretty intoxicated by this time and couldn't remember how long Roger stayed, but she thought he eventually left with Chris and Richard stayed the night with her. Donna said the next thing she remembered was being woken up by the supervisor, calling to find out why the Pizza Hut wasn't opened yet. She thought that this was around 9.15 a.m. It was actually Donna's duty to make sure the restaurant was open on time. She heard to get herself and her two kids ready to go. Donna said when she got in her car, she had to pull the front seat up, which she thought was weird because she hadn't driven the car since the previous Saturday night and the seat wouldn't have been in that position. She said Richard didn't have a key to her car, but she kept her keys on a hook in the kitchen and that's where they were that morning when she went to grab them. Donna and Richard didn't arrive to Pizza Hut until after 10 a.m. Donna testified that she was a heavy sleeper when she drinks and that it's possible that Richard could have easily left her house on the morning of the 24th without her knowing. A corrections officer with the Travis County Sheriff's Department named Gilbert also testified for the state. Gilbert worked at the jail where both Richard and Chris were being held, and one of his duties was to serve dinner to the inmates. Chris helped Gilbert serve food on April 25th. He was to hand out trays one at a time as the inmates came through the line. After Richard got his tray and a drink, he stated, quote, that's the MFR that squealed on me, end quote, and then threw his drink into Chris's face. Gilbert said he got in between the men, but Richard ran him over trying to get to Chris. Gilbert was able to push Richard away and call for help, and he told Chris to go to another room. For Richard's defense, they focused on his alibi and reiterated that he was with Donna on the morning of Nancy's murder. They also pointed out that the only link they even had between Richard and the crime scene was this weak hair comparison. And hair comparison isn't an exact science, so the defense argued that it wasn't really even a link at all. Richard testified in his own defense. While he was on the stand, he had to wear a bulletproof vest due to death threats he had been receiving. He said he didn't take any part in Nancy's rape or murder and that he was at Donna's, and he was very adamant about his innocence. He said that Chris was lying, and so were the police. Prosecutors countered that they could corroborate Chris's confession with evidence, and the evidence that they supposedly had was, number one, that Richard knew that the gun was a 22 caliber and that a blue apron was put into the sink to flood the restaurant, which, according to them, proved that he was there. They also had a hair that was consistent with his pubic hair found at the scene, and they also thought that that situation where he had accused Chris of squealing on him was evidence of his guilt, and they also brought up other details such as the seat in Donna's car being back and Richard's different comments to the police about having Donna as his alibi. I don't really see how those are... No. Evidence in this kind of a case, but that's what they were going with. So after a little over three hours of deliberation, the jury ended up finding Richard guilty of aggravated sexual assault. The day after the verdict was announced, Richard was sentenced to life in prison. The jurors only took seven minutes to decide that he should get the harshest penalty possible. Officials said that it was actually one of the fastest decisions in the history of the county. Nancy's mom told the media that they felt joy and relief after 15 months of waiting for somebody to be held accountable for her murder. Her mom said, quote, the judicial system has done its job. Unfortunately, that 
wasn't the case. And what happened next is really one of the most heartbreaking things I've ever heard in one of the stories we've covered. And we're going to get into it after one last break to hear a word from this week's sponsors. So before the break, we find out that Richard has just been sentenced to life in prison for the aggravated sexual assault of Nancy DePriest after his friend Chris has falsely implicated him in the crime due to police coercion. A little over one year after Richard began serving his sentence, he was attacked in prison by another inmate in a case of mistaken identity. Richard was actually critically injured in the attack and was rushed to a hospital where he underwent emergency surgery to remove part of his brain. Richard survived, but he had to be taken to an institution because the attack left him unable to take care of himself. He was 22 years old at the time, and he now requires 24-hour care. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. In 1992, authorities started to become suspicious of Detective Polanco and his tactics in several cases that were unrelated to Richard and Chris. So Polanco was accused by his peers of coercing a false confession and lying on the witness stand and was actually filmed beating a suspect. He was fired, but then an arbitrator exonerated him, so he was let back on the force where he remained for many more years. I don't understand how that works. How does that work? (laughs) I mean... (sighs) They had video of him beating somebody. Like, how do you... I don't know how you exonerate yourself from that. I mean, it's pretty clear if it's on video. It's on video. Yeah, I know. So now we have Chris, who's serving a life sentence for a murder he didn't commit because he was intimidated and coerced into giving a false confession. And we have Richard, who has lifelong brain damage and a severe disability after being attacked in prison while serving time for the same crime, which he also didn't commit. And time marches on. By 1998, Nancy's case had long been considered solved and justice served. Two young men's lives were completely ruined, and the real killer was under the radar. That is, until finally, Akeem Marino wrote the governor of Texas, begging him to contact Chris and Richard's attorney and right this wrong, because he was the man who really murdered Nancy. So when the governor's office first received this confession letter, they actually never turned it over to law enforcement. And a spokesperson later said that it was because Akeem wrote in in the letter that he was also going to be sending it to the DA's office. So they just thought... We don't need to contact anyone. He's going to send this to the DA's office anyway, which is just wild to me that the governor's office would, I guess, I mean, I don't know how many letters they get. Why would you just double check? I know. They, would, they could get a duplicate. It? Yeah, exactly. So it wasn't until Akeem wrote another letter to the police telling them where they could find evidence that things finally started to come to light and come together. Akeem said that the bank bag used to steal the money and the handcuffs used to restrain Nancy could be found at his parents' house. And he said that the murder weapon had actually been seized from him when he was arrested for the other robberies he was already (laughs) serving time for, which, again, is mind-blowing to me. I guess I just assumed that any time a gun is seized from someone, they, like, check to make sure it hasn't been used in a crime. They didn't do that in this case. I don't know if that's a standard practice, but... It seemed crazy to me, right, that they wouldn't have known right then and there that that was the gun used in Nancy's murder, although I guess they weren't looking because they thought that the crime had already been solved. So the police were able to track down all these items that Akeem mentioned, and they did confirm that they were, in fact, from Nancy's case. Investigators went to visit Chris in prison, but he wasn't very welcoming because he was still rightfully very fearful of the police, and he worried that they were just trying to pin something else on him. So he continued to stick with the false story that he and Richard had actually committed Nancy's murder. Meanwhile, authorities continued to investigate Akeem's confession. When Chris found out that somebody else had confessed to the murder, it gave him a little bit of hope that he might actually be able to prove his innocence. So in June of 1999, he wrote to the Wisconsin Innocence Project and told them about his situation. The Innocence Project then took Chris's case on, and they wrote to the Texas authorities on his behalf. But thankfully, the DA was already on it by this point. Investigators got DNA samples from Akeem in August of 2000, and they conducted multiple DNA tests, including testing the semen sample from the rape kit. The results were clear. Akeem was the man who raped Nancy. The test conclusively excluded Chris and Richard and completely implicated Akeem. The hair from the arcade was retested using mitochondrial DNA, and they conclusively excluded Richard as the source of the hair with that method. Ballistics tests run on the gun seized from Akeem proved that it was, in fact, the murder weapon. Soon after authorities announced that they had convicted the wrong men for Nancy's murder, Detective Polanco retired from the force. Wow. Yeah. 
Nancy's mom told the Marshall Project that hearing this news that the wrong men had been in prison for her daughter's murder the entire time was a huge shock to her, as I, I can't even imagine. It's almost like reliving everything all over again. And yeah. then it's just this added layer of now like, oh my gosh, like just that realization that these two men didn't do it. She said that she collapsed in a chair and just couldn't believe it. She was absolutely livid as well because nobody had called her and told her this before they announced it on the television. That's the first call you make. The only right. call you make is to tell her. That's, oh my gosh. On January 16th, 2001, the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals overturned the convictions of Chris and Richard and they were both released. Nancy's mom, Jeanette, attended the hearings and she actually sat with Chris's mom and held her hand. That night, they both went out to dinner. Before the night was through, Nancy's mom pulled Chris aside and asked him why he confessed. He told her that after so many hours in the interrogation room without food or water, he just broke. Unfortunately, Nancy's mom never got to meet Richard because he was immediately transferred into the custody of his family members. Jeanette later went to visit Akeem in prison and asked him why he killed her daughter. Akeem told her that he had voices in his head telling him to make a human sacrifice if he wanted the voices to go away. Jeanette asked him if it worked, if the voices went away, and Akeem said no. She wanted to know whether or not Nancy said anything before she died, and Akeem said the only thing Nancy said was, quote, please don't hurt me, end quote. He said she didn't know or see that he was going to shoot her before he did. Jeanette later told ABC that she had believed Chris's version of events for years. This meant that she believed Nancy was sodomized and had been raped eight times repeatedly, begging for her life throughout. Jeanette said, quote, for me and my family to have gone through all these years of believing those things, it is unbearable, end quote. Jeanette said she had nightmares for years, thinking this is what happened to her daughter. The DA wanted to seek the death penalty for Akeem, but Jeanette said no. She said she didn't want to, quote unquote, stain her daughter's memory with Akeem's blood and that she, quote, didn't want to be a party to the taking of human life, end quote. Once this whole bombshell was dropped and the word was out about the wrongful conviction, the Texas Rangers investigated the three detectives who interrogated Chris and Richard. The investigation, however, was unable to determine whether or not Chris was intimidated into confessing. It did determine that Chris's confession contained details that only the police or the perpetrator would know and that some of his confession also included details that the police should have known were not factual. The investigation also showed that from the very beginning, the investigators formed inaccurate conclusions about the crime that resulted in misrepresentations of the crime scene, and because of that, mistakes were made that led to the conviction of Chris and Richard. It was also determined that investigators did not follow up on early leads and failed to interview witnesses or influenced witnesses with suggestive questioning. The lack of documentation in this case was also noted. Unfortunately, though, it seems like none of the officers got into any real trouble for how they handled Nancy's case. In October of 2002, Akeem went to trial for Nancy's murder. So remember, he's already serving three life sentences, but as we said, he felt compelled to confess to this murder due to his religious beliefs. But he pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. Akeem said that he'd been hearing voices in his head since he was a child, and these voices demanded things of him and gave him special knowledge. And one of the things these voices told him to do was to sacrifice Nancy. Akeem said that the voices finally went away after he became a Christian, after he was already imprisoned for his other crimes. The jury ruled that Akeem was guilty and said that he knew what he was doing when he killed Nancy. He was given an automatic life sentence since Jeanette did not want the death penalty. After being exonerated, Richard and Chris both filed wrongful conviction lawsuits against Travis County and the city of Austin. Richard got $9 million from the city, $1 million from the county, and $250,000 in state compensation. Chris received $5.3 million from the city, and he had to give $500,000 of his payout to Richard. Chris said, quote, I am sorry. I feel guilty about what happened to Richard. I feel very bad for not having the courage to stand up to the police, end quote. Due to his brain injury, Richard needs lifelong care, which his sister provides as his legal guardian. She wrote a statement that said in part, quote, Richard now suffers from seizures, mental problems, and partial paralysis on the left side of his body. After he was released from prison, his care was transferred from the prison system to family members. Richard still has someone making his appointments, taking him to the doctor, making sure he takes his medications, pays his bills. 
The only difference from being in jail is that now he has people who care about his well-being. My question to you is where is the justice, end quote. I wrote to Haley um, after I read this research that she sent us for this case, and I was telling her that this part of the story is like, I don't, something about this, just thinking about it, it just upsets me so much. Like thinking yeah. about, you know, putting yourself in a mother's position and thinking about like this being your son and this happening to them and like there's no coming back from the type of brain injury that he got in prison and he shouldn't have even been there in the first place. And it's just so tragic to think about someone's life turning out that way. Like it just really, truly breaks my heart. Yeah. All because they're really trying to just close the case. They, these officers did not care about who was guilty. They wanted it closed and they wanted to, at least the one wanted to pat himself on the back about it. it it's so gross. So since being released from prison, Chris earned a college degree and completed law school at the University of Wisconsin, and he is now a practicing attorney. In 2006, both Chris and Nancy's mom, Jeanette, testified before the California Commission on the Fair Administration of Justice, advocating for the videotaping of interrogations. Chris spoke about his experience and about how often false confessions happen. Between 1986 and 2006, so that's... 20 years, 30 years, I'm always wrong. Uh, the 80s have me confused. 20 <laughs> years. <laughs> 100 inmates have been exonerated by DNA. Of those 180, 44 had falsely confessed. Wow. Jeanette said, quote, I have heard lots of people say I would never do that. Never confess to something I didn't do. How do you know what you would do if you were in that interrogation with the man I call El Diablo? End quote. And she was referring to Polanco. Keith A. Finley, a University of Wisconsin law professor and co-director of the University of Wisconsin Law School's Innocence Project, said, quote, cases like this reveal in very dramatic terms that this does happen, not just with people who are mentally ill or of limited intelligence or otherwise vulnerable, such as children. It happens with mentally healthy, intelligent people like Christopher Ochoa. There's so much to be mad about with this case. I mean, all of it, like... I just don't get it. I mean, I, I good for people for saying this is suspicious. Please look into it. But when you make a call like that to police and for whatever reason, this Pizza Hut employee finds it suspicious, they're not saying, why do we have to go to this person's guilty? Why not just talk to, I don't know. It's just the yeah. whole thing like from the beginning was handled like, oh, somebody finds somebody suspicious. Well, we've got to, we've got to close the case. This is what we're going to do. But to... I don't know. It's just infuriating. The whole thing is infuriating. And they were lied to. He was lied to about talking to an attorney. Just all no of it. No one cared about them. <laughs> right. And it really is so heartbreaking and just tragic all around. Like, I, I just, I don't know of any other words to really use, you know, and to think that they were only 18 and 22, like so young. And so like, of course they didn't know any better. They, you know, if, it's, it would be so easy to be intimidated by the police at, at any age, but especially totally. at that age, you know, and just like really not knowing a lot about how the world works and how these things, you know, not having experience or being exposed to stories of, you know, police coercions and stuff and just thinking that the police are just doing their job and not that they're trying to actually pin a murder on you. It's just mind blowing that that yeah. this could happen and just terribly, terribly sad for everybody involved. And it makes it extra sad for the family, right? Because Nancy's death, like the right person wasn't even in prison for it. Right. The right person wasn't even charged. So then there's this whole other thing. If that guy wouldn't have been in prison, who knows what else he would have done? He was unwell. So who knows what would have happened? And they were just like, case closed. I guess we're done with this. On to the next thing. It's so sad, but it's amazing what Chris has been able to do. And I just, my heart breaks for him, but Richard's family, Richard and his family, it just, oh my yeah. gosh. And Nancy's yeah. family. It's just a lot of tragedy there. Yeah. All right, Melissa, are we ready to move on to the last thing before we go? We are. Mandy, this only happens once or twice a year. You get to talk about <laughs> reality TV. <laughs> yeah. And only with one show, right? We only get to talk about Love is Blind. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so this week, I guess they released a, an After the Altar Love is Blind season three special. Three episodes, right? There was three episodes. And I'm going to let you lead our conversation on this today because when I tell you that my brain has absolutely turned to mush over the last like 48 hours, I mean like I watched these three episodes and I – 
watch them twice. And like already sitting here, I'm like, what even happened? So you're going to have to jog my memory. <laughs> sure. Can I tell you what happened? Yes, Nothing. of course. That oh. is why... <laughs> That's why it doesn't feel like it. They drug this crap on for three episodes. So basically we see Alexa and Brennan happy. Good Still love them. them. Still love them. Yeah, I great. follow all of these people on Instagram. So I no. see them um, like daily and like Alexa and Brennan post a lot of content like all the time. So I'm always watching them and they are just so freaking stinking cute. I love them so much. I'm so happy that they are together and happy. I think they're hilarious. Love them. Yeah, they're fine. Whatever. Then <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm only in these shows for the drama and they don't bring any drama. So I'm like, they don't. great, you're happy. I love Let's to love to the them. Ones. I don't have okay. to love to hate them. I love to love them. <laughs> yeah, I'm only here to hate them. Um, but you can't hate them. They're great. So next is Colleen and Matt. So Colleen, if you remember, was the ballerina. And I only um, say that because that was like that a was big her thing. thing. Yeah. <laughs> and Matt was like a very angry man in my opinion um mandy how did you feel about them in this after the altar special so we know that they're married i still they're feel st like they don't even like each other <laughs> they don't they're still not living together um which i can understand how they're like okay we did do this crazy thing and got married like let's take it slow if we want this to work he's been married before for whatever reason they both are just like oh let's not he's been married together. before how did i miss that it was like, they like kind of hide that, but I know they mentioned it and they mentioned it in this, in one of these episodes. Cause I was like, oh yeah. Cause normally you don't have that on these shows. Cause I think that was where some of his issues were with like thinking she was going to leave him and stuff. But, um, yeah, you think they don't like each other? I think they don't like each other. And I also follow her on Instagram oh, and Lord. see like her posts about like the two of them and stuff. I don't know. I'm just not buying it. I'm sorry. <laughs> No, I get it. I don't think so either. Oh, and then I watched a TikTok of somebody who was like, they're trying to make Matt look funny and he's not. And it was a clip and it showed Colleen laughing at something Matt said three different times, but doing the same like hair tuck behind her ear, <laughs> head tilt, where it was like very obvious the editors were like, we got nothing with them. What are we going to do? And just like played her, her laughing oh three gosh. times. <laughs> and I was like, well, that makes sense. So basically for them, it was just like, are you – do you like me? I mean, he annoys her and he would annoy me too. And he even says, <laughs> I try to annoy her, which. They're just, I mean, he's too immature. They're both too immature. I feel like. Yeah. I think this feels like they're married for spite at this point. I don't think anybody's happy. No, I don't either. And I don't think I would be all that sad if they separated. <laughs> no, I don't think anyone, including their families would be either. Okay. Who else do we have? We have, I'm going to leave that one for last. We have Nancy and Bartise. I do not know what Nancy's deal is and why she has any interest or, I mean, maybe she doesn't. She acts like she doesn't have an interest in Bartise, but I think it's very clear that she does and like wishes maybe that something would have been different. But I don't really know why because I think Bartise is incredibly obnoxious. He's so obnoxious and just he was like, I found out that girls like think I'm flirting when I'm just being nice and oh, blah, please. blah, blah. I'm like, <laughs> get over yourself. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> he is not. I mean, so like that was their whole thing. Like, uh, are we like we're friends, but should we still be friends? My family hates you, but maybe we could still be friends too. Like, I'm an independent woman. I don't need you as my friend, which it's true. It's just like holding her back if she's trying to like figure out why things didn't work out or yeah, whatever. It is. I mean, yeah, he's definitely the type of guy who you would be in a relationship with for like two years and then be like, what are we? <laughs> like not, yeah, still not even knowing. Like, like, I didn't know we were dating. <laughs> right, exactly. Like still not even knowing where you stand and everything. Like I, I think he has a lot of growing up to do for sure. And Nancy strikes me as somebody who really truly is ready to settle down and find like that person. Right. Don't think Bartise was ready to get married when he went on the show and no. still don't think he is. He's going to be on another show. Mandy, when I tell you how angry I was at the end of this, when they show us a new show called Perfect Match, hosted by Nick Lachey, which I blame you for bringing more Nick Lachey into our life. But I guess Vanessa was not invited to be on this, which is fine with me. Maybe she just said, I'm sitting this one out. She's like, you can take this one, honey. I'm, I'm not doing any more reality shows. Vanessa likes the attention. So I don't think that's what happened. Um, I think Netflix read their comments. So anyway, that show is like people from like The Circle, different seasons of Love is Blind, all different things come together and you have to like match with somebody. I think it's like Love Island-esque or you get kicked off or something. I don't know. I tried to watch like five minutes of it and I got through the preview and I was like, I can't. 
I can't even this. I watch a show called Milf Manor, and this is too much for me. I can't do this. <laughs> so <laughs> I love Milf Manor. So Nancy and Bartiz, there's really nothing good to say, I would say, right? Yeah. And I think Nancy's mom is so funny. I just want to say, and like, I love, I appreciate that she just tells Nancy how it is whenever she was talking about her feelings about yeah. parties. I was like, you tell her. <laughs> yeah, it's true. All right. How about Zenob and Cole? We don't care about the cuties. Can we just stop with the stupid oranges? I know a producer handed it to him, but I don't care. I just don't want to say much because I don't have anything nice to say about Zineb. <laughs> well, yeah, don't because somebody that follows us on Instagram says she's really nice in person and stuff. I'm so sure I'm she is. I, I'm sure she is. she's getting a bad edit. Yeah. And we've, we've talked about that before too. Of course it's made for TV. So like they edit things to intentionally look a certain way or to, you know, make a person on the show look a certain way. I don't know how Zineb is in real life. She is cute on Instagram. She always has really cute outfits. I will say that. But, she's adorable, um, I think. Yeah, she's super cute. Um, I still feel the same as I did when the season ended that I I think Cole like was really just like railroaded by the whole experience. I think Cole is probably not as bad of a guy as some people might like you to believe, but I don't I think know. he <laughs> says what's on his brain too quickly and doesn't process it for like how it could come across. He might have so a th- little bit of like foot and mouth syndrome for yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think he does come across sometimes as like kind of, I don't know, like different than he means to because when he explains himself, you're like, okay, that makes sense. And I do think he can be a decent person. I think they're just a terrible match. Oh, for I sure. I think she's very sensitive and he has foot and mouth syndrome. And so that's that's not going to work. No, I feel like they just definitely clash um, personality wise. Like I just, yeah. and I felt that way, you know, from the beginning that they just weren't really a good match. Like I was kind of not surprised that they ended up with each other, but I just, I felt like their personalities definitely, um, did not go together. Yeah. I'm this, but the whole thing on this was like, oh my gosh, are they like this conversation between them at Alexa's birthday party? It's going to be so weird. <laughs> it was fine. It was just whatever. Like I was like, you guys did not need to make a special out of all these people. But what they did need to make a special out out of was SK and Raven. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So SK and Raven, even though they didn't get married, apparently continued dating after um, the show, after he said, no, not going to marry you. And truly, I thought that Raven was going to take her opportunity to just be like, great, peace out, and go back to doing her thing. Um, But she... You know, in the beginning of uh, Love is Blind, that season, we kind of thought that, like, maybe she didn't really care about SK or that she was kind of, like, shallow. But it ended up being that she actually did have a lot of feelings for SK and truly cared about him and wanted to be in a relationship with him. So they stayed together. And then what happened, Melissa? And then they got engaged again. They got re-engaged. Again. Yeah, and, then, and then, And then what actually happened is she found out he was cheating on her. Which... The audacity. <laughs> honestly. The audacity. Honestly. And there's just no, no way. Like that's just, that blows my mind. I don't know what he was thinking. <laughs> well, I don't know. We can't even get into what he was thinking because he couldn't have been thinking or just he's an idiot. I don't know. But yeah, it was sad. I remember seeing stuff on TikTok about Me their too. relationship. So you're just like, we knew it was coming. And Sue, I think that's kind of the unfortunate thing with reality shows now. We know so much of what happens before like before when you would watch a reality show you had no idea now you get like i saw the real housewives filming at blah 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 and this person was yelling at this person on twitter or whatever and you're like oh that's going to be a storyline right and now i feel like we get so much more than we used to so it's not as exciting not that i think like a breakup over infidelity is exciting but it was like okay that wasn't a surprise yeah yeah well there's no surprises anymore i guess for like these types of recap things that they do on these shows now because yeah if you follow people on social media you've already seen it there first and then some so it's kind of like i didn't learn anything new that i didn't already know but um i still think it's shocking that sk would cheat on raven and the audacity i just i don't I don't know. I mean, it takes a special person to really love all that velvet. So <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that. Yeah. So are you excited for a new season of Love is Blind, which they didn't announce, but it just made me think. Oh, of course. I'm here for it. I'm here for it. No matter what. No matter are when Are you going to watch Perfect Match? Uh, probably not. 
don't. I don't want to have to watch it. I tried and it was like, I, I truly don't care about these people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think I'm going to. And especially like, I don't know. I don't want to see Bartise on another show anyway. Like I don't know. Once I've seen people, once I've seen a cast of characters, like I'm over it. I don't want to ever see them again. <laughs> no, even this like after the reunion special was so dumb because we already got an after the altar schedule, like alt- after the altar special, like I just don't care about these people. Stop trying to make them happen. I don't want them to happen. Right. <laughs> right. We had a dark period of time where we all made them happen and we're done. Let's be done as a, as a nation, as as the world. <laughs> For sure. I agree. All right, Melissa. That's it, Mandy. Is that it? That's your final word. That's our final word mm-hmm. on Love is Blind season three. <laughs> Yeah, never again. Never again. All right, guys. Well, that was the story for this week. We will be back next week. Same time, same place, new story. Have a great week. Bye.